Good afternoon. I'm Jim Murphy here at Grove Forward Offices in, in downtown Chicago on a beautiful spring afternoon. And I've got the pleasure today of talking with Elizabeth Shaw, CEO of Chicago International Charter Schools. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thanks for having me, Jim. Happy great, to be here. Great to be here. You know, I always like to start with my viewers and talk a little bit about your history, talk a little bit about, um, you know, where you grew up, just a little bit about your education and how you worked your way towards this, uh, this title of this job you have now. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I am a Chicago kid, grew up in the city, went to CPS, um, grew up around North and Sedgwick, um, went to CPS for uh, nine years, went to private high school, uh, and then went away for college uh, and spent about spent four years of college away from the city of Chicago, and then about 18 years after that, um, living and working in other places. I went into the classroom straight out of college uh, and worked my way up through a lot of different education systems, had the opportunity to work for schools and communities in a lot of places in the country uh, and see the challenges that our education systems face across a lot of different contexts. And then I was getting ready to move back to Chicago, my hometown, because uh, my oldest was getting ready for kindergarten and I wanted to enroll her at CPS uh, and was offered the opportunity to lead CICS and I jumped at it. Um, and my daughter is now uh, in her third year at CPS. So I noticed in your resume that um, you spent some time in Louisiana. Yeah, so uh, I, I went down to Louisiana in 2007, uh, right shortly after Hurricane Katrina. There was a lot of recovery and rebuilding work. Um, and my area is basically talent and instruction in education. Those are the two areas I'm most interested in. Mm -hmm. And so I had an opportunity to, uh, to move down to Louisiana and to oversee talent for the recovery school district uh, during a really critical period of post-hurricane rebuilding. Um, and so yeah, I spent three years working at the district and then a couple years working at the state, um, improving really human capital policies and helping them shift from a view of talent in schools and HR in schools that was a lot more transactional, processing paperwork, processing payroll, uh, to a more strategic citywide approach to talent. Was that New Orleans? In New Orleans, that's right. Was Paul Vallis head of the district then? Paul Vallis was head of the district then. Oh. Yep, worked right. under Paul for, um, for my, my whole time in New Orleans. Wow, yeah, because when we, I worked with Paul a little bit in the late 90s, so I got to know him a little bit then. And uh, yeah, he's, uh, he's quite somebody to work with. It's a great experience. Not something I, I will soon forget, uh, I'm sure for you. I learned a tremendous amount from working with Paul. Right, right. And he was a great boss. Good. What, um, so you said you came back because your oldest was gonna go to kindergarten. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so tell us about the the search that was going on to hire somebody at Chicago International Charter School. Yeah, so at that point, um, the longtime CEO who had been there for a dozen years or so, Beth Purvis, um, had gone to the governor's office to, uh, to work with Governor Rahner, and um, CICS was undergoing a national search for a CEO, uh, and one of my friends asked me to have a conversation with the board chair. I had been running a national education policy and strategy group called Education First, had been there for almost five years uh, as the CEO, and loved my job and wasn't planning on making any sort of career transition when I was moving to Chicago because I was able to move my job along with me. Um, and one of my, one of my uh, friends encouraged me to have a conversation with the board chair of CICS. And I said, I'll have a polite conversation with anyone, um, but I'm not looking for a new job. And after the conversation, I was really intrigued uh, by CICS, by the opportunity to serve kids in Chicago, my hometown, school system that produced me and that I plan to put my kids back in. Um, also the scale, it's 8,300 kids, 14 schools, um, a scale where you can really make an impact on communities and on a school system, um, and a scale where real improvement and transformation is possible across 14 schools. It takes time, it takes a lot of skill and a lot of energy, um, but it's possible across 14 schools. And so I really like the scale, I really liked um, the opportunity in Chicago. I uh, love the people who are working at CICS. We've got some of the most talented and dedicated educators, operational staff, financial staff, um, 
uh, administrative staff in the whole city working in our schools. Um, and I really was intrigued by the model of CICS, which takes, as you know, because you help found CICS originally. Um, it's a really different approach to running schools. So I thought that was really interesting and an opportunity worth um, worth jumping for. So yeah, I, I took the job. Now, have you just, are you just concluding your third year? Is That's that right. correct? That's right, Jim. So what has been the biggest positive surprise in your three years? You know, we've got the best kids in the city. I probably should have known that going into the job. Um, but uh, our kids are, um, I don't know that I'm surprised by it, but I am impressed and amazed by how um, brilliant and, uh, and talented and committed and high energy uh, and focused on their futures they are every day, whether it's at our highest performing school um, or at a school that is struggling more. Uh, the kids are what I am always most impressed by at CICS. I'd say the adults I'm really impressed by as well. Um, like I said, we've got folks who've been, you know, the organization's been around for 20 years. We've got this cadre of folks that we joke came with the building. It's the same people who you knew when you founded the organization 20 years ago. They're still around. They still would do anything for our kids in our communities. And they're part of what makes the organization and the schools really awesome. Do they physically still do the lotteries to get into your school? Do you do them in the, like the parents come and you pull the names out of the hat? Yes, sir. Every year there is a lottery um, and one single lottery for all 14 campuses. Our staff um, right now, a woman named Edith Prado is uh, overseeing all of our enrollment and she does a terrific job every year um, with the CICS lottery. How do you do lottery. one lottery for 14 schools? It's logistically complicated, but it's the same basic process. Now there is a, you know, there's a computerized component to it as well, um, to our lottery. But um, it's the same basic process as you do for um, you do for just one campus. But now it's 14 waiting lists and it's 14 um, actual kind of pulls of names. A lot of my viewers don't know the difference between a charter school and selective enrollment, um, but a charter school does not get to test kids in, do, does it? No, sir. We, it, it's fundamental to our mission. Um, it's, it's who we are as an organization, and it's part of the charter school law. We take all kids, um, no matter what. So there is no selection whatsoever. Um, and it would be actually really pretty, it would run pretty contrary to what we're trying to do um, to implement any sort of uh, restriction for who can come to our schools. I remember early on when we opened up the high school at Northtown, and uh, I don't remember what year it was exactly, but statistically, we had the fifth highest percentage going to college, four-year college of graduates of any high school in the city, and the other four ahead of us were all selective enrollment, mm -hmm. which is hard to it's hard to beat a school that only takes top three or four percent of sure the applicants is. with with a wide open. You know how does how do you how do you get that message out? How does a, how do parents find out that these quality schools are there that where their kids don't have to test into, and they can just come and be part of a lottery? How do you do that? It's a great question, Jim. You know, I think different different schools probably believe different things about this. I know that there's different approaches to kind of marketing, but I think a good school, a really good school. Um, the parents and the kids are going to sell it for you. So Northtown, the school that you just mentioned, is a great example. And I'd say this is true for, our, for, for all of our kind of our, our top performing schools. Um, if a parent loves their school and a kid loves their school, then they're talking about it to their neighbors and their cousins. And every time they hear someone dissatisfied with the, the services they're getting from another school, they're going to chime in and talk about the experience they're getting um, from their charter school. So word of mouth and parents talking to other parents is the way that uh, that I think we most effectively spread the word about our great schools. I mean. We do flyering, we do you know I, campaigns I see, to get it out, but uh, it's mainly uh, it's main the most effective word of mouth. I find it interesting that schools like CICS uh, put ads on the buses. Mm -hmm. Okay, because when you think about it, most schools don't have to do that. Okay, S you know most it's high schools don't well. It's an interesting it's an interesting question, Jim. I mean. 
With declining enrollment across the city of Chicago, I think we see lots of schools experiencing declining enrollment, including um, level one schools. The reality is that there are a lot of seats and a lot of unoccupied seats in Chicago. And so I think it's a pretty, I think it's a pretty special dynamic that is growing, that schools feel like they need to compete for kids and families. That's how it should, that, that's actually, I believe, how it should be. The parents should, um, the parents should really feel like the school is trying to woo them and provide them with the best possible opportunity, the best possible choice for their kids. And I think it's a really, um, it's a good dynamic that we've got to, we've got to fight for our, for our kids and our families a little bit. Well, it empowers the consumer, doesn't it? That's exactly right. The consumer right. then becomes the boss because they've got the, it's kind of like when you go buy a car, the car salesman doesn't get to tell you what kind of car to buy. He tries to sell you the car. That's exactly right. It's like, it, like in the so in the eighties, growing up in Chicago myself, um, you know, there's a handful of magnet schools, or you know, if you can afford it, there's private schools. But for the most part, where you live is going to dictate what dictated back then where you went to school, um, and in a society in in a city that is economically, socially, racially segregated, um, and where there's vast variety in quality of neighborhood schools, um, that's that, that's really not fair to kids whose zip code would mean that they're zoned for, um, they're zoned for a bad school or a school that's not going to put them on a path to success in college and career. So I think it's really, a, it's a huge leap forward that parents now have access to so many choices. Are there enough seats in charter schools for the parents that want to send their kids there? We have long waiting. So uh, we have long waiting lists at all of our highest performing schools. Um, and long other waiting charters, lists. A lot other of charters time. are the same way? All the high performing ones. Um, the schools that are really consistently outperforming CPS schools all have really long waiting lists. So, what is the logic you think behind uh, not opening more charters? if people want to go there. I don't, Jim, what do you think the logic is behind I'm not asking, opening I'm more charter schools? You're questions. asking the questions. Okay, I'm fair enough. I'm asking the questions. Fair enough. Um, so I think that the I'm dynamic- you the expert. I don't know yeah, the answer to this question. Fair enough. Uh, I don't know if I'm the expert, but I'll give it a go. Um, I think the dynamic of competition makes some people uncomfortable. Um, this, this idea that, that we've somehow introduced competition. Um, and I would say, you know, uh, my, my counter argument to folks who think that we shouldn't be competing for kids, we shouldn't be competing for seats, we shouldn't be introducing choice, um, is that it, and that we should be improving the neighborhood schools, is that it takes a long time to improve schools. And you can't, you know, you, you can't ask a kid to sit through the three years, the five years of time that they'll lose in a failing school without giving them better options. It's a basic civil rights issue. And we see it, we see choice all over our system. It just falls along lines of privilege. So I think a lot of the time, folks who are saying we shouldn't open, you know, we shouldn't open more charter schools, we've already got saturation. A lot of folks who are making that argument are folks who are accessing choice for their own children in different ways. So I see hypocrisy in the argument that we shouldn't be offering choices um, to all kids because privileged families certainly access the choice of parochial schools or picking certain zip codes. Um, and we got to make sure it's a basic civil rights issue. We have to make sure that low-income students um, and black and Latinx students in our city have access to similar choices. So low-income kids shouldn't be forced to sit at the back of the bus in order to keep the system going. Well, they shouldn't be forced to go where they're zoned to go um, if no one else in the city is forced into that paradigm. Right. There right. should be enough charter seats. There should be enough um, high-quality seats for them to have some choices. I have a friend of mine who's on some committee that and we were having dinner one night and he told me he's so excited about it because he's going to fix the school system and you know we have to get rid of these charters and mm -hmm. he didn't know that I had was working I had worked with charters and you know he's and I, I looked at him I said are you why do you say that and he says well because they take money away from the public schools 
So we then had a debate over dinner, and we were, I think we got it worked out. I'm sure that was fun. It was fun. I think we got it worked out. But what do you say to people when they say uh, um, that uh, money to charters isn't, is taking funding away from public schools? Um, I would say that the dollars do not belong to the schools, ever. The dollars belong to the children. The dollars are publicly provided per child um, in order to provide high quality education to that child. And the parents um, might choose that not, to t not to send their kid to a lower performing school. They might choose to send their kid to a higher performing public school um, through accessing charter schools. And those dollars were always intended for the child, not intended for any particular neighborhood, any particular set of adults. And so I, 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 I I reject the premise, I guess, um, that it's taking dollars from traditional public schools. I think the other thing that's really challenging for me about that argument, and someone made it to me just the other day, Jim, is I was a Chicago public school student in the 80s, and I was lucky enough to go to a really terrific Chicago public school, like a lot of kids who look like me. We're, like, we're lucky enough to go to um, terrific Chicago public schools. And a lot of kids who don't look like me were lucky enough to go to um, terrific Chicago public schools. But there were a lot of kids um, in the 80s who didn't go to terrific public schools. Um, and the idea that the introduction of choice into the system is the problem, and that's what's hurt public education, uh, it, it harkens back to some golden days before there were charter schools, before kind of, you know, these resources were diverted. Um, and I think it's just, it's misremembering history. There were the same inequalities, there were the same consistent school failure, failures, in, in fact worse, before charter schools came along. Um, the systems have improved across the board since charter schools came along. Um, so there, there's no era when, when all of the traditional public schools were just providing these incredible educations to every kid, including in low-income communities, communities and then the charter schools came by and ruined it there were there was endemic school failure across a lot of urban systems and really persistent school failure in the city of Chicago and that's part of what charter schools were solving for in the first place so um, it didn't seem to be working all that well when charter schools weren't drawing resources either I think it was 1979 when the Secretary of Education Bennett was that his name he said Chicago was the worst school system in the country. 79, you're going to have to remember the I history think I remember on, that. I think. I think that, and then he became kind of famous and gave a lot of talks and a lot of speeches and was been active in education for a long, he was for a long time. Uh, but in 1979, it was the worst mm -hmm. education system in the country. And it's come a long way. It has I mean, come a long way. There's reasons to be positive. Okay? There, yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot to be optimistic reasons, about. A lot of reasons to be positive. Including about, uh, including about the growth at CPS. And what I think, though, Jim, is I think it's part of a whole system. I think that the introduction of um, schools that are essentially competing for, for families and for students, the introduction of other models, innovation through charter schools um, and new approaches to charter schools that grew up outside of the CPS system is part of what's pushed the traditional system to improve. And I'm certainly not saying that's the only thing and there are tremendous numbers of hardworking educators at CPS who have um, who are responsible for a lot of those improvements, but it's a whole system-wide improvement when we look at the data from CPS. Charter schools, the, you know, the 30% the of, or 15% of CPS kids that attend charter schools are included in that data um, and that, that trajectory that, that shows, and we hear a lot about, that shows CPS improving so much. So charters are part of that story. They're not the, they're not, um, they're not the problem in that story. So when I look at en enrollment stats, I see private schools increasing in the last five years. I see charter schools flat because they're being capped. Mm -hmm. And I see CPS declining. That's right. That's okay. what I'm seeing too. So do you think they people want to think we should have a law that says people have to go to unions, I mean CPS schools? Or do you think that uh, that the marketplace could the marketplace should continue to grow. Otherwise, private schools are really going to be uh, a much more, a much bigger part of the marketplace in Chicago. 
That's right. Um, do I think there should be a law that requires people <laughs> to go to CPS schools? CPS schools. I think, I mean, that's a real softball. No, of course not. <laughs> um, no, I, I mean, I just, I, as a parent, I access choice. As a kid, I access choice. I think every parent should be able to access choice. And again, I think, um, I think what we see in a, in a city where there is tremendous income dis disparity and a lot of the time power and privilege falls along income lines. Um, if there was a law like that, I would imagine that it wouldn't be hurting um, high income kids. It would end up hurting low income kids and low income kids are the ones who would be robbed of choices and options. Do you see anything that's going to turn around the decline in the CPS schools? I mean, I think this mm. year was a big drop. Yeah, this year was another big drop in CPS. You know, it's, I, I, I'd say I'd give the same answer as I gave with charter schools. You know what attracts kids is school quality and parents talking about loving their schools. Um, now, the, 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 the CPS, what's interesting about, what I think is interesting about the decline right now is that the CPS enrollment decline mostly tracks to um, the population decline in Chicago, which is really interesting that charters are not experiencing a similar decline. I think it speaks to the parent demand um, for charter schools, but I think quality is the only way that we're gonna, that we're gonna turn that around or CPS is gonna turn that around at all. Um, and obviously they're all working really hard on that. So tell me, uh, let's switch subjects a little bit and, and talk a little bit about um, one of your schools. One of my favorite one of your schools is Longwood. Mm -hmm. Why don't you tell the viewers a little bit about Longwood and history of Longwood because it is one of the first two original campuses and kind of tell everybody where it's at right now and how it's doing and, and what kind of facility it is. And yeah, absolutely. Um, so I took someone to visit Longwood. I love taking people to visit Longwood because um, their reaction is really funny but my favorite was um, a new staff member I took to uh, visit Longwood and we did a kind of tour of all the ca the whole campus and then afterwards he turned to me and he was like oh okay so it's like Hogwarts except on the south side of Chicago um, which I thought was like a really really good kind of description of the school uh, we you know it's a it's a very very old was originally you know it's our building now we own it and I should say I, it's not really our building it's our six buildings because um, it's six buildings that take up um, uh, 95th Street to 96th Street, um, and then Loomis to Troop um, on the south side. Uh, and it's these, you know, this, this kind of um, incredible, old, beautiful, um, got kind of brick, it's a brick building, um, and it used to be, uh, it's been a it's been a lot of things, but it's been I think parts of it have been a convent, mm -hmm. um, parts of it uh, were an old Catholic school, and actually the history of the you know it, it's Our Lady, right? Uh, um, yeah, Our it's Lady. An, it was an all yeah. girls all school girl. for probably I don't know seventy five or eighty years. Yeah, I want to say like Our, Our Lady of. Our Lady Academy of, of Our Lady. Academy of Our Lady, um, and uh, we actually have a, we have a couple of team members at CICS who uh, who's, who's, whose grandmothers um, went to Our Lady. Uh, and you know, it was a really kind of very, very well-regarded Catholic school on the south side. Um, you know, and the population changed as the neighborhood changed. Um, so there's a rich history there in terms of the alumni base of, uh, of that school. But CICS opened that campus, gosh, 1997. Um, so uh, 22 years ago. Um, and it now serves about 1,800 kids. And what's really special about that campus, in addition to its really beautiful um, historic grounds, is that it serves kids from kindergarten through 12th grade. Um, and so when you think about how much you can accomplish with kids in elementary school in, ter in terms of putting them on a path to succeed in college and life. Um, when you get kids for 13 years, you can really, really um, set them on a great trajectory. Is it a fairly high percentage that stay all the way through? Um, we're working on increasing the percentage that stay uh, all the way through. Not as many as we would like stay all the way through, um, but but actually we're working on it a lot. And I. I I think we'll see increases in retention all 13 years. 
throughout. Because well, I remember in a long time ago, kids would stay till eighth grade and then they'd sometimes go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like yeah. Yeah, we still have that happen. Um, and there are different factors, right? There's, you know, some kids go because they, you know, they want to go to a bigger high school with a better sport, with a better sports program. And we've got pretty good sports program for a charter school at Longwood High School, um, but still, sometimes they're looking for, you know, a Simeon or another kind of bigger school with a bigger athletic program. Um, but yeah, sometimes they don't go all the way through. Without naming the school, tell us about one that's most challenging. Mm. I don't want the kids to watch it and say, "Oh my goodness." Yeah, I mean, you know. Do you have one that stands out, or two, or that what, what, stands what makes out. what makes them challenging? Let's ask it that way. Yeah, so I think in um, I think historically across Chicago, across CICS, um, high school is always uh, has always been the hardest to move. Um, so high schools uh, are traditionally the most challenging. Um, places to get improvement, and I think there's um, there's a lot of things that feed into that. I think one of them is, you know, by the time they, but by the time you you get to high school, kids have either spent nine years staying on track or nine years um, falling behind, um, and you know, you we take all kids, and so um, at ninth grade, you uh, you know, there's there's often a lot of catch up that needs to happen. Uh, and then I think there's a tremendous amount of social pressure that we see at the high school level um, that just gets uh, gets more and more challenging for kids uh, as they get older, as they you know as they take on different responsibilities, as there are different kind of opportunities and risks in their communities. So high school, I, I would say, high schools in general um, are 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 more challenging. I was always a fan of the Noble Street, the Noble Schools, because they did only did high school, mm -hmm. and what a nice job that they've done at so many of those yeah. as, as one of our competitors. Yeah, hey, they do a, they do a terrific job, and we celebrate their successes. They've got great leadership over right. there, and um, and you know a lot of our kids go to Noble School, so we want to see them continue to grow and continue to thrive, but. I'm with you. I'm impressed by a lot of the work happening at Noble. What uh, What is your enrollment goal? Where are you at and what are you trying to get to? We are at 8,300 and we're trying to stay stable right now. We're not trying to grow aggressively, partially because um, we don't have much space to grow. Um, our campuses are pretty full right now. Um, and so we're, we're at 8,300 kids and we want to stay at 8,300 kids for the present. We also have some areas where we're really focusing on two things. One of them is kind of poor performance improvement and increasing quality. And the second is innovation. So really shifting towards 21st century models um, where kids are prepared not just uh, for the economy of today or the economy of yesterday, but the economy of the future and ready to get these 21st century jobs. So um, those are two of the things that we're focusing on. Um, and once we feel like we're really doing fabulous at quality across the board and really um, excelling at innovative models across all 14 campuses, that's when we'll be uh, talking more aggressively about growth. You had a challenging uh, period of time uh, late in the winter this year with a strike. Mm, you noticed that, huh? Yeah. So I'm just wondering, uh, how did that change your organization? How did what did what did that do to you in terms of a as an organization financially or emotionally or or within the school system? How, how, how did that impact you? Yeah. So I, I would say um, a strike like any big organizational crisis is basically you take the organization and you put it into a pressure cooker. Um, and so there was a strike at four of our campuses. Um, uh, and the strike was between the CTU and one of our operators, Civitas Education Partners. Um, and I think what we saw during the course of um, the strike is we saw 2,200 kids out of school for nine days. And so when we did the calculations, that's millions and millions of lost instructional minutes, um, a huge cost. And 2,200 Chicago kids out of school in the middle of February, some of them housing insecure, some of them food insecure. Um, so it was, it was really, really tough for the organization, mainly really, really tough for families and kids really tough for educators um, and you know as you probably saw during this strike there was a level of 
um, vitriol that uh, that's really that that was really really divisive, and I think um, was really hard for you know for the teachers within their ranks. Um, certainly uh, created some challenges between uh, between teachers and management, um, and we're working through that as an organization. I think my one of my biggest lessons from the strike was. Um, that we kind of all needed to get to a place of listening and empathy in all of it because um, I do believe that the teachers who are on the picket lines want the best for their kids, their students, um, and that's what they were do. They, that's what they were striking for. Um, and I also believe that management at Civitas Education Partners, who was working hard to get to a resolution, um, wants what's best for the kids in the organization. Um, and unfortunately, I think it. I think it was a real shame that it took 2,200 kids out of school for nine days um, to get to that common understanding. Do you think that CICS spends a higher percentage of their funding in the classroom than CPS? Uh, yes, it's hard. It's it's hard to get the full CPS numbers just because of the way that they report their funding. There's a different um, there's a different uh, level of transparency around where every dollar that goes into CPS goes. Um, but we've done, we actually three years ago did, uh, did commission someone to do an external study of how much uh, similar charter school organizations and districts spend per pupil on facilities, on management, on classrooms. And what we found very, very consistently is that we are spending about on par with other charter networks in terms of management um, and facilities, significantly less than traditional districts um, on management and significantly more on facilities because we don't get facilities um, given to us the way that traditional so districts Facilities do. are included in your in your in your budget and your mm -hmm. uh, what you have to spend on your from your distribution from CPS, where on the other side their their buildings and their facilities are funded either through debt or through through bond through bonds primarily, yep. and all the, even that interest is off their budget. That's right. And um, it is quite significantly different. I I I, I happen to have done a little research on it, and um, I, th I think my numbers are close to right, but. Um, I think there's around 60, 65,000 charter school kids in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And I, my numbers tell me that they get around 10,000 a kid. Is that correct? That's about right. So the way I look at it, that's about 600 to $650 million in entirety mm -hmm. in, uh, spent in charter schools for 60 to 65,000 kids, which leads, leads 300,000 in the other schools. Mm -hmm. And the budget is $6 billion. Mm -hmm left and that's my numbers say that's 20,000 a kid now that's they'll never tell you nobody ever says that but that's what my research tells me because I just divide the number of kids into the budget you know I just all I did just simple math I didn't mm -hmm. do anything complex and layer things all over the place right just simple math there's six billion left there's 300,000 kids yeah so one thing that I've been surprised by and I think that across the board I, I am I'm frustrated by and I think educators across the city are frustrated by and I, I would say across the state is that is um, that we can't we, we, we don't have a clear handle um, or clear reporting of per pupil funding so we want to we, we want to actually know what's coming in what's going out um, per pupil, and we, uh, it seems to be a little bit of a black box. So if you did per pupil funding on all CPS schools, you'd probably end up with at least a billion or a billion and a half that's not accounted for by the schools. If you say so, Jim. I think so. I think my math would say, you know, my math would say there's, there's some money going that's not going to the classrooms in the regular CPS school, that's going into the, into the it's some dark yeah. space. I don't know where it goes. Yeah, but, so uh, it, it, it could be. It could be, but I think the big, to me the biggest problem is that we can't answer that question definitively. Um, ultimately, if we're for transparency and public accountability in government, which I am, uh, then we should know right. every dollar, where it's being spent, how it's being spent, how it flows from the state, and there should be an incredibly clear 
formula that is transparent and commonly understood for from the state level and from the district level and I think we're pretty short of that now. I'm often amazed that taxpayers don't demand it, okay, that they just, well, they're doing the best they can. You well, know, may if, maybe they should if, demand it, if Jim. If 6.6 .6 billion isn't enough, we should give them 7 billion, yeah. and we should give them 7 and a half billion, and then enrollment continues to decline, so the per pupil continues to go up. It's really quite amazing. I, I, I don't know how it is that it continues to go like that, and I'm not asking you a question there, I'm making more of a, personal statement myself, but yep. um, it, the taxpayers need to think about it and parents need to think about it because if they had abilities to choose all, in my opinion, choose all across the city, um, their choices would be their ability to pick and choose a, the right school for their kid. It might mm -hmm. not be the best school in all the system, but it could be the right school for their child, okay, will we'll empower them to a level that they're not familiar with today. I completely agree. And I, I also think that's, I mean, your point about it might not be the best school. I think who gets to be the arbiter of what's the best school anyway? Part of the point for me as a parent is, you know, and I'll take my, my own kids. I send them to a CPS school that offers daily language instruction. It's really important to me that they get, you know, and it's, it's you know, it's not, it's not our neighborhood school, it's a magnet school. Not selective, magnet school, I had to, to, to take a lottery to get in there. Um, but it's important to me that my kids get daily language instruction. It's more important to me than them attending a gifted school. Um, and so that's what we choose. I think every parent should have an opportunity to make those sorts of choices and trade-offs because the values of communities are different and the values of families are different um, and everybody deserves uh, educational opportunity that uh, that resonates with their family's priorities and values. Uh, it's, it's disappointing at times that that, uh, that these other kids like I said are forced to go to the back of the bus and they don't get to choose. Mm -hmm. That's right. They don't get to choose. So um, in the past year or a year ago, uh, the previous governor passed uh, the voucher tax credit bill here in Illinois. Uh, many of us who believed in, in, in choice and vouchers were excited about that. Uh, but I'm wondering if it impacted your enrollment at all, or did you see it impacting the schools around you in terms of kids coming there in any way? You know, uh, our schools are already schools of choice, so parents have already made educated decisions when they've decided to send their kids to CICS schools, right. and it's a privilege that they make that choice. Um, but we really didn't see much change in our, you know, in our enrollment when the voucher program got released. Good. Well, I, I'll tell you, I think you're doing a great job over there at CICS and really, Thanks, uh, really keeping this thing on track. It's like you said, over 20 years, been a great experiment to try to make it last forever and uh, uh, you got to keep building it and keep uh, keep the uh, improvement of the product for the parents to choose to keep coming there and keep improving the locations and buy better buildings <laughs> fix them up <laughs> yep and we'll uh, keep doing that keep doing what you're doing and surround yourself with the right people but you're doing a great job I'm very proud of you thanks jim Thank really you. appreciate it thanks Thank for you. having me Thank it was you. great chatting with you